Hi, and welcome to the e-commerce MVP video cast. In this brief video, I'll explain how you can find a minimum viable product to sell online. First, I'll cover what exactly is an MVP and the five factors I use to evaluate a minimum viable product. All right, so what exactly is a minimum viable product? To illustrate, let's look at the example of these two donuts. The donut on the left is your basic plain donut. It's just deep fried dough. The one on the right has some cream inside as well as some sprinkles. Now, if I'm running an MVP business using the MVP model, my goal is to minimize risk and capital investment for the highest possible rate of return based on the amount of risk and investment I made. Also, the product and the business has to be scalable. Now, let's apply this to the donuts. The donut on the left, the plain one, represents the least amount of risk and investment. Why? Because I don't have to spend a lot of money on ingredients. Anyone can make it. There's not much risk associated with it. The one on the right requires additional funding because I have to buy more ingredients. I have to buy the cream, the sprinkles. I might even have to hire someone to make this donut for me. So there's risk associated with it. Now, no doubt, this donut has more demand. It also yields a higher profit margin, but it comes with risk and more money involved. The goal of the MVP is to get the product to market as quickly as possible. You want something that's just good enough. In other words, there has to be just a little bit of demand for it. And once you start selling this product, you know you'll be able to sell this one. But you don't want to jump in and buy all the ingredients and buy or hire people and turns out that you won't be able to sell this product. So if I'm going to open up a donut shop, I'd start with this plain donut and offer some coffee. Once I get a few customers, I scale up and I start branching out. Now the goal of my business is to grow and make money. I start with the fundamentals and I scale up incrementally. I start with a small coffee shop around the corner and one day through quantifiable data and small steps, I will turn this into a franchise. Now this can be applied to online, sh online shopping as well. If you want to open up a shoe store, for example, don't go out and buy thousands of pairs of shoes from suppliers. Start with three or four pairs of shoes. Start with the basic models and build that up incrementally. You take the least amount of risk with the least amount of investment and you try to turn a profit. Once you sell three or four of those shoes, you scale up. You take bigger risks. You go out and buy more products. You start customizing your products. But you start with the minimum viable product first. All right, now that we've covered the fundamentals of an MVP, let's get into product evaluation. How do you find products or how do you know if a product is worth acquiring? Well, there are five factors that I use to evaluate products, starting with cost. Under the MVP model, my goal is to keep expenses at a minimum. I don't want to have to take on too much risk and I don't want to have to spend too much money to acquire products. Ideally, I like to keep my product acquisitions under $100. This way, I'm only spending a little bit of money, and if it doesn't work out, well, it's only $100. Now, if you have a little bit more money or you're not opposed to taking on a little bit more risk, you can spend more. But don't go out and spend thousands of dollars without knowing for sure that you can sell your products. Now, things like electronics traditionally have very little profit margins and are expensive to acquire, so I avoid this category altogether. Furniture, on the other hand, has very high profit margins, but again, the cost of acquiring so a sofa, a chair, is fairly high. So I'll have to buy multiple units in order to build my inventory. That's going to cost me a couple of thousand dollars easily. So I don't get things like furniture either. Now clothing, while it's very competitive, is also very adverse to risk because the cost of acquisition of clothing is really cheap. For example, I can get this hoodie for 10 or $12, so therefore I can buy 10, maybe even 20. And I have some inventory to work with now. And if I have inventory, there are a number of things I can do, like showcase my product, get different styles, give away a product uh, to get some feedback from customers. So of the three products you see here, it would make sense to go after the hoodie because that is the MVP. I'm starting with a basic product and I'm trying to scale it up. Once I get my store going and I get a few sales, I can expand it into other products. I can get into shoes, I can get into other fashion category, and I can keep scaling it up. Right, moving on to the second factor I use to evaluate products, which is demand. Now it goes without saying, if you're running a business, you want to be selling products or a service that people actually want. 
For an e-commerce site, it's really important to select a niche product. So what is a niche product? A niche product is something that caters to a very specific or targeted audience. To illustrate what a niche product is, let's use the example of yoga pants. Now, if I were to sell regular yoga pants, I'd be appealing to a very broad audience because there are millions of people, especially women, who are shopping for yoga pants. Since the demand for this product is really high, so too is the competition. Now, if I'm a new business, and again, I'm using the MVP model, I don't have a big marketing budget. So it's going to be hard for me to compete against sites that are already established who are selling yoga pants. On the other hand, if I were to sell maternity yoga pants, well now I'm catering to a very targeted audience, pregnant women who want to continue to do yoga. Now the demand for maternity yoga pants is going to be far less than regular yoga pants. But since demand is lower, so too are the number of suppliers, meaning I have less competition. Now another advantage to selling a niche product is that the profit margins tend to be a lot higher. If I sell regular yoga pants, it's basically a race to the bottom. Since I'm competing against the thousands of other suppliers, we're going to keep lowering our price because the customer has so many options to choose from, chances are he or she will just buy the cheapest pair, unless I'm offering something really unique. Now if I'm competing against, let's say, only a handful of stores that are specializing in maternity yoga pants, well now I have a unique product and I can keep my price high. Even if my competitor is selling at a lower price, I can offer better value. I can create better content for my site. I can establish a brand and not have to worry about lowering my price when the demand continues to grow. Okay, let's get back to product demand here. Now, I typically target products that have between 1,000 and 5,000 monthly searches. Products with this many searches are generally considered to be niche. If you have more than 5,000, it could be more. Let's say you have 20,000. Chances are it's a product that's in high demand. And again, it has a lot of competitors. If I find a product that has less than 1,000 monthly searches, it might not be enough to actually bring significant traffic to my site. So generally speaking, this is the sweet spot between 1,000 and 5,000 searches a month. Now, there are a number of tools you can use to gauge demand. I like to use Google Keyword Planner, Google Trends, and KW Finder. And I'll actually show you how to use some of these. So the first place I like to start is with Google Trends. And this gives me a general overview and it gives me a little bit of information if there is a demand for a specific product. If I use the same example as Yoga Pants, I'm just going to go to Google Trends here. You can see it's google.com slash trends. I'm going to type in Yoga Pants. Okay and I'll get a general idea to see if there's interest in this product. Fortunately, Google does an awesome job of compiling data over long periods of time on all the search volume. And as you can see, the demand for yoga pants is clearly increasing. Back in 2011, uh, we had a handful of people searching for these products, and it continues to grow. Now, the numbers don't get too caught up in this because um, they're not that accurate, but it's to give you an overview. Generally speaking, I like to look for the trend line, right? And you get to see that the trend line for yoga pants is obviously increasing, meaning it's an increasingly popular activity, and therefore, while the activity is popular, so too are all the sales, all the products that go along with that, yoga shirts, yoga pants, yoga studios. It's all going to increase, and you see that the trend line is showing me that it's continuing to grow. If you look at, this is a breakdown of you know, the regional interest. So if you're selling products in Canada, then you want to see what it's like in Canada or the United States or any other country. So this is a great place to start. So I get an idea. I know that the product is increasing, so I'll continue my search. The next thing I'll do is do some keyword research. And for this, I'll use kwfinder.com. That's kwfinder.com up here. And you can get a free account, and they give you, I think it's like five or ten free searches. Uh, registration is free, you would just do that here. Now, if I go with the example of yoga pants here again, let's see what we get. And here are the results. Now, if I look at yoga pants, this is a very broad keyword search. And you can see that I have, on average, 368,000 people searching for, these, for this keyword, yoga pants. The cost per click 
Meaning if I were to advertise and I wanted to advertise for the keyword yoga pants, it would cost me about $1.68. So if I created an ad with the word yoga pants in it and someone clicked on it, I would pay Google $1.68. Okay. Now, if I go further down, it gives me some other product ideas as well. Yoga pants for women, 4,400 monthly searches and the cost per click, again, this is for advertising, is $1.42. And I'll explain the advertising shortly. Now, if I, the, the more narrower I get, the more targeted I get, in other words, the more keywords I use, the demand decreases. That's because people start off searching with a very broad search, like yoga pants, and then they continue to furtherly define the product they're looking for. So if I were to go back and look for pregnant, or I type in maternity yoga pants, you're going to see that the demand for this is going to be a lot less than regular yoga pants. And there it is, 3,600 searches, which is in my sweet zone of 1,000 to 5,000 searches. So there's enough demand out there. Again, if I compare it to yoga pants, 368,000 people searching for this. Maternity yoga pants, only 3,600. But again, this is the niche category, and it's a lot easier for me to target 3,600 people as opposed to 368,000 people. You'll also notice the cost per click for that keyword is significantly less, almost half. I also noticed that the overall trend for these products is increasing. As you can see here, the trend line is, generally speaking, it is growing. So that's just an introduction to demand. Now, I encourage you to do your own reading on how to actually use these tools and uh, increase your knowledge of doing product research. But this is an overview. It gets you started. So far, maternity yoga pants is looking pretty good because there is a little bit of demand for it. The cost per click is below $2, which means it's somewhat cheap. The general trend line is growing, meaning people are looking for this product. So, so far, I have a product that I know I can get for less than $100. I should be able to acquire yoga pants for $10 to $20 from a supplier overseas. And there is demand for it. So two out of the five criteria have been fulfilled. All right, now that we've covered cost of acquisition and demand, let's move on to the third factor, which is size. Now, this is really straightforward. If I'm running an MVP business, and I've said this a number of times, I want to minimize expenses and risk and maximize my time so that I can focus on growing or scaling the business. Now, shipping is a real hassle. Right? If I sell a large product with multiple sizes, it becomes a hassle to figure out how I'm going to get it to my customer, how much it's going to cost, how am I going to get it picked up, or how am I going to drop this off at the post office. As a rule of thumb, if a product doesn't fit in a shoebox, I don't want to sell it. Why? Because, for example, I can get a product like a mini fridge for probably less than $100 and get a pretty decent return on investment. The problem is getting it to my customer. If I'm shipping this thing from Washington down to Florida, it becomes a hassle to figure out the cost, how I'm going to get it there, how long it's going to take, plus it's pretty heavy also. If I sell a product like yoga pants or a hoodie, I can put this in a standard size box and know exactly how much it's going to cost every time. If I use a service like USPS or if you're in Canada, the Canada Post, they have standard packages where the price is fixed. I can get this ship for probably less than five bucks. And therefore, if I know how much it costs to ship every time, I can incorporate it into my costs and it becomes a lot easier to set up my website. I don't have to put in all these complex shipping calculation algorithms. I can just say shipping is $3, $4, $5, whatever it is, and not have to think about it again. All right, moving on. The most important question, how much money can I actually make? What is going to be my return on investment? Now, we said earlier that the goal of the MVP is to spend as little as possible to make as much as possible. So if I were to buy a sofa for $500, I can sell it for $1,000. But that's a lot of risk because I'm putting a lot of money up front. If I buy a few pairs of yoga pants for, let's say, $10, I could sell them for $30. While the profit margin might not be as high, the risk is also not as high. Typically speaking, I like to target, when I'm starting out, a return on investment of 50%. Meaning, if I buy a product for $10, I need to be able to sell it for at least $15 to justify my time. 
Now this number is going to grow significantly as your business grows. Once I'm established, I'm going to target an ROI of 100% or maybe even 200%. But that will come with time. As my business grows and I have some data and some information to back up my, my business, I'm willing to spend more and take a little bit more risk in order to make more. But as an MVP, when I'm starting out, I want to keep risk and the capital investment at an absolute minimum. Okay, so how do I actually calculate ROI? ROI is basically the money you make, the profit, over the expenses. It's the ratio of profits to expenses. So again, if you made $15 and you spent $10, your ROI is 50%. Profits, which is obvious, is basically your selling price minus your expenses. So if you run an actual store, you would take all the merchandise you sold, cal calculate that, and subtract your expenses, like paying employees or renting your building. If you're running an online business, your selling price would be how much you sold the product for minus the cost of your domain, your hosting, um, if you're having to pay for a merchant account. Uh, all these things go into your expenses. Now the third category is the CAC, or Cost of Customer Acquisition, and uh, I'll explain this in the next slide a little bit further on, but it's basically the amount of money you spend in order to acquire a customer, which in the online world is basically digital marketing. Now if you're a little bit confused, don't worry, let's just look at an example and you'll see that it's really straightforward. Let's work with the example that we've been using, which is maternity yoga pants. Now let's say I have a supplier and I get these maternity yoga pants for $10 a piece and I turn around and sell them on my website for $30 a piece. Now there are going to be some additional costs, mainly advertising. If you're a new e-commerce business, you're probably going to have to invest a little bit of advertising, be it Google AdWords, Facebook, or any other platform. You're going to, find, you're going to need to find a way to generate some traffic to your website. So, we have some data here, and if I go back to KW Finder and I look at the data for maternity yoga pants, we said that the cost per click, meaning this is how much I would have to pay Google if I want to advertise with them uh, to get a customer to my website. This is the average cost. So just to give you an example of how it works, if I type in maternity yoga pants, I'm going to get a bunch of results. The products that you see here, these are advertising. These companies are paying Google a fixed amount of money to advertise, to have their products shown. The same for the results you see here. They're, notice that it says advertising or ad. So, for example, Macy's will have to pay Google $1.49 more or less, depending on how well they advertise, uh, for me to click on this website. The results that you see here, these are called organic results. It's free to be listed here. As a business, your goal is to get listed really high on the first page of Google. But to do that, it takes a lot of time. It takes SEO practices, which is a whole other topic. If you want to get traffic really easily, you have to spend a little bit of money, but you can be featured on, on, on this section as well. Now, pay-per-click advertising or social media advertising is a whole other topic. The point being that you're going to have to spend a little bit of money to be listed here. So let's say uh, I do get my ads for uh, $2 a piece. So someone clicks on my ad, meaning I paid Google $2. That person comes to my site and he buys the yoga pants for $30. Let's do some basic math. The cost to acquire the customer, the customer acquisition cost is $2 from AdWords. Therefore, my profit is $30 minus $12. 12 comes from $2 for the ads and $10 to buy the product from my supplier, which gives me a total profit of $18. My, my ROI is my total profit over my total expenses. So $18, my profit over my expenses, which were uh, the cost of the product itself, $10, and the cost to acquire the customer, $2. So 18 over 12, that gives me 150% profit. That's not bad, that's excellent. Realistically, for a new business, I'm probably gonna have to spend a little bit more on ads because my website is new, uh, I don't have an established brand, and because I'm new to advertising, I'll probably make a little bit, a few, a few mistakes. So, 
if I can get even 50% when I'm starting an MVP business, that's pretty good. So, so far, using the example of yoga pants, it's looking pretty good because the cost to acquire the product is less than $100. I can make a profit margin of 150%, realistically maybe 50%, and the demand, as we saw, is fairly high. Also, I can put it in a shoebox and get it out the door and not have to worry about the cost of shipping or any other complexities. So, so far, four out of five factors, it's looking pretty good. All right, with that being said, let's move on to the last factor, which is content. Now, not a lot of people consider content when deciding which product to sell, but they should because it's really important. Content, good content, is what drives traffic to your website. People buy products from people they trust. So if you have good content that educates your customers or makes them laugh or makes them feel some type of emotion, you're likely to garner their trust. And if you do that, you'll be able to sell to them. Also, good content is what, what drives traffic to your website. If people are finding your content and if they're sharing it and they're reading it and they're putting it in social media profiles, Google will take note of that and they're going to rank your website higher. One of the goals of an MVP business is to minimize expenses. In the previous slide, we talked about CPC, which is cost per click advertising on Google. If you want to avoid having to spend a lot of money on advertising, one of the ways to do that is to get your website ranked high on Google for a key keyword. And having good quality content is one way to do that. Because if your content is being read and being shared, Google will notice that and they're going to rank your website higher. Also, content is what's going to make you unique. Now, earlier we talked about having a niche product. No matter how niche your product is, you're going to have some level of competition. And if you want to avoid getting into a price war, one of the ways to do that is to have unique, good quality content. Put yourself in the customer's shoes. If I have a website that's educating me, let's say that I want to buy yoga pants. If I find a website that has content, content can be things like they're giving me tips on yoga, they're giving me expert advice, they're showing me cool graphics, things that I can do to improve my form, or it could be anything really. If I can relate to that website, I make a connection with that website, I'm more likely to buy from them. Even if it costs a little bit more, I feel that connection and therefore I'm willing to spend a little bit more because I trust the seller. So content is really important because it drives traffic to your site, it builds trust with your customer, and it's what makes you unique. Ideally, you want to choose a product where you can write interesting and engaging content that can go viral on social media. Here's an example of a company, and this is a real company. They take a potato, an ordinary potato, and they put a message on it. And this product has actually gone viral. Now, if you receive this potato, chances are you're going to want to share it. You'll probably put it on Facebook. You'll probably put it on any other social media set you have. And that is going to generate a lot of interest. The search engines will notice that. The website will notice that. And you'll get organic traffic that way. So if you're going to pick a product, make sure that you can write engaging content about it. If you're going to sell yoga pants, then make sure that you can write a lot about yoga pants, which you can. It's hard to write about TV remotes or furniture. There's only so much you can do. But if you have a product where you can write infinite amount of interesting, engaging content, it's going to help you sell more products. It's going to help you rank higher on Google and bring more customers to your site. And that wraps up this video on how to select an MVP product. To recap, remember, as an MVP business, you want to keep expenses at a minimum and mitigate risk. Try to find products that cost less than $100 to acquire. Make sure that there's enough demand for the product. The product should be really easy to ship. As a rule of thumb, if it fits in a shoebox, it'll be easy to ship. You also want to make sure that it's profitable, obviously very important. And you want to make sure that the product is likable and shareable through viral content. That wraps up this lesson. Be sure to check out my next video where I walk you through the process of actually sourcing MVP products from suppliers overseas or domestically. If you like the video, please follow us on uh, social media. The links are going to be at the bottom of this video. And be sure to check back at our blog where I'll be posting new content and new videos to help you run your MVP business. Thank you.